So let's start from the top. Some of these are familiar, some less so. Let's have a look at this one at the top. If I presented this to you and said, please integrate that, right? What is your first thought as you look at it? Don't worry about the actual answer, just th tell me what your thought process is. Difference between two squares, thank you. Now, in this case, I've given you an obvious example, right? A quadratic that is, there's a nice name behind the factorization. But it's just the fact that it can be factorized, right? If I had just easily given you something like this, my good old favorite quadratic expression there, right? Even though it's not difference of squares, in the same way, you can Factorize that denominator. And then once you factorize it, what can you do? We can do partial fractions, right? Just like we did before, okay? So my thought here is, my thought is, if it's a, um, a denominator that can be factorized, if the denominator is quadratic, but it can be factorized, then we're pretty much good to go in terms of using partial fractions, okay? And that happens a lot. So this is the first sort of class, if you like, of quadratic denominators that you're going to encounter. If the denominator can be factorized, then go ahead, split it apart into partial fractions. I'm slowly lazy here, I'm even just going to write, like the primitive will come out of, uh, well, it'll be something like a on, in this case, x minus 1, b on, x plus 1, dx. You're going to get some logs, and then off you go. So this is the first category, right, and it's the easiest. These second two, they both come in the context of extension 1. Now, if we were just extension 1 students, you could look at these and say, well, what else can I do with these? I've got a handy dandy reference sheet, which actually helps me here, which I'll get in a second, okay? But you are not extension 1 students. You, well, you are not just extension 1 students. You have all this other stuff that's floating around here. So here is my way of determining what these actually equal to when you've got these other ones to mix them up with. Look carefully with me at this first one. I think it's the easiest to recognize. Look at that denominator for a second. It's all about the denominator, right? Can someone tell me, what kind of shape is that? If I just ask you to focus on the denominator, what shape is that? Semicircle. That's a semicircle. It's not just any semicircle. It's the unit, unit semicircle. It's the top part, anyway. Okay? Now, for me, when I think of the unit circle, in stage six, I think trigonometry. This is my mental cue to say, oh, this is an inverse trig primitive, right? That's where I'm going to land, okay? This first one on the unit circle, uh, what are the two coordinates that we have for the x and the y? What, what do we use when we put in a parameter of theta? Sine. Sine and cos, right? Sine and cos, not tan. So therefore, what you're going to get here is, in fact, I can write it all the way over here on the right-hand side, I'm going to get sine inverse of x plus a constant, right? The unit circle, that was my... Um, that was my mental cue. That denominator looks a whole lot like the unit circle. And that's what prompts me to remember, oh, sine and cosine. I actually don't have on the reference sheet, I don't have a result for cosine because it's just a, a shifted version, version of this, right, of cos inverse. So that's me remembering that it's going to be sine inverse. When you have a look at the third one, right, 1 plus x squared. Again, me mentioning to you that this is in the context of extension 1, that should signal to you, oh, it's the other inverse trig one, which is tan. So we can write ahead on the, go ahead and write on the right-hand side, it's going to be tan inverse. But for me, my mental cue is, this is something which, unlike the first one, which I can turn into partial fractions, and unlike the second one, which has that reminder of the unit circle, that doesn't look like the unit circle to me. It isn't, right? I mean, it's a parabola, moved up a little bit, um, the denominator, anyway. And I can't factorize it either, right? So the denominator can't be factorized, and it does, doesn't give me that other Q. So that's what tells me I'm still in this. If you have a look at the similarity between um, these two denominators here, they've both got the 1 and the x squared in that order. Um, that's what tells me I'm still in inverse tree gland. Now, just as I mentioned before, and it's worth noting down, um, because these are still extension 1 results, you have the benefit of the reference sheet telling you what these results actually are. So if you want to see what it looks like, I've got it here. There you go. Make it a bit smaller because I've gone over the top of other things. This is what you'll see on, sorry, make it a bit smaller, there you go. This is what you'll see on the reference sheet, right? Now what you will notice, I hope, is that this is the souped up version, the generalized version of handling sine inverse and tan inverse. Because if you have a look here, um, you don't always get a 1 here, right? You could get any square number, or even if you get something like 3, 
you're going to end up with the square root of 3 over here, right? Also, um, we can do more than just the sine inverse of x. You can do sine inverse of any function. This is including the reverse chain rule in there as well. Okay, so what I wanted to do here, I'm giving you purposefully these simplified versions here so you can focus on which family of functions do you end up with? Is it sine inverse? Is it tan inverse? And this is how you modify from there. Okay? All right, have a look down at this uh, fourth one on the table. Have a think about your starter questions, right? What is your mental cue that tells you where you can go with this? Emmanuel. Uh, x equals to square root k tangent theta. Ooh, can you say that again one more time? x equals to? x equals to square root k tangent theta. Square root k tangent theta, times tangent theta. Under the square root or not under the square root? Next to On the outside, like this? Yes. Hmm. And where does your brain go next after that? Uh, and I just because if you if you if you square that one thing, you, you can differentiate it first. Oh. So you get uh -huh. x oh. and uh -huh. and something and the the theta. Mm -hmm. Then then you can suck this thing back into the x. Mm -hmm. and you will got uh, uh, if you simplify, you will get uh, square root k times cis theta. Huh. Then you can cancel out. Okay. Okay. The so. So I've been teaching, because I've been teaching maths for a while now, I usually get to anticipate, even when someone has something from left field, I'm like, oh yeah, I could see that coming. For example, Varen completely ruined my lesson plan the other day by the option I had, which I was going to tell you about third. He said first. I was like, well, great. Okay, I'm going to, I'll run with it. It's fine. Okay. This one, I'm actually not 100% following yet. So I'm going, to, I'm going to park this idea. I'm just going to pop it in here so that I can remember to come back to it. I want you to think back to your starter questions just to make sure we're all on the same page, right? That result over there in the integrand, does it look familiar when you have a look at your starter questions? Which question did we have a look at that landed us on something like this, Pahan? Are you just stretching? You give me the answer, you wanna give me the answer, right? It's the, it's the LN thing, right? Have a look at question two, your starter question, right? We dif I handed you a function, we differentiated it. From memory, the function was something like log of x plus a square root of I think I gave you guys x squared minus 7? Yeah. x squared minus 7. Um, in fact, it can be, well, I'll, I'm going to put a plus or minus in there. Hopefully you notice as you went through that differentiation, actually really didn't matter what that 7 was. It could have been 8 or 9 or pi or e. could have been minus as well. That never came in because that constant right there doesn't affect your inside derivative. So that's why I've put this plus or minus k in there. When you differentiate this, you land here, right? If you differentiate this, you get this. So it stands to reason against thinking back to advanced, right? If I reverse this process, if I take this and integrate, I should land back where I started. That's my primitive, right? So with one minor modification, I'll have this log, right? I'll have the x plus the square root of x squared whatever was underneath there. What's the one difference? Because I'm integrating now. This, oh, yes, that's true. That's true. I need my constant of integration. There's another difference. Thank you. Absolute values. By the way, um, I, I mentioned it before, um, but I artfully forgot to put it on your canvas page. After this, I'm going to be putting, like, why those absolute value signs are there is a really important question for you to answer as extension two students. And just saying the logs are positive doesn't cut it. So I'm going to put that link in. Please remind me someone afterwards if I forget. Okay. So, We're most of the way down here. Yeah, question. Asking, isn't it that formula used to be in the old, uh, old syllabus <laughs> machine, but why is it there? Yes, that's a good question. So, <coughs> excuse me. Morgan is correct. Um, actually, you know what? Can I hit pause on that question? Only because it, has a, it is a long and interesting answer, a long and interesting answer that I do know and am happy to share with you, but maybe not at this exact time in this lesson. Okay. Maybe after we Go get on. people going. But remind me, okay? Old table of standard equals. All right. Can you please compare this fifth one here with a quadratic denominator? Just compare it to all the other ones previous to that. <sighs> Have a think at what distinguishes this, and this is a tricky question to answer, but what distinguishes this one from all of the previous ones? Emmanuel, what do you say? You, you, uh, you, you cannot factorize it as long as you can't see it. And if you cannot factorize it, you need to complete the square. Okay, so I did mention this, and it's even on your page, right? Um, the syllabus itself says integrate rational functions involving a quadratic genre by completing the square. This is the kind of question, or this is the kind of integrand they're talking about. But I want to highlight to you why. Can you look back up at the four rational functions above? 
The thing that stands out to me is none of them have linear terms in the denominator. Can you see that? There's never an x term. There's an x squared, there's a constant term, there's never an x. Okay? So therefore, as we've so often done in maths, we want to try and turn a problem that's weird looking into one that we're more familiar with. These will always turn into something like what you see up above. So long as you can, let's write the note together, complete the square. right? So what we're going to do, just as an example, right, is we will end up with something like 1 over and then, you know, if, if I'd given you something monic over here, then I guess you would have something like x plus k all squared plus some other thing, I don't know, l squared with respect to x. This is what we get after completing the square. And then there's this extra bit hanging on the end, right? But we can deal with this. We can deal with this in the same way that we did dealt with all the previous ones, right? I guess this particular one looks like it would turn into a uh, tan inverse, right? If I threw in a square root down here, like so, I can still deal with it. It's going to be a log of some kind, right? So the completing the square turns this thing, which is just a shifted version of all the previous ones, into something we're all already familiar with. Okay, so last one. And then I'm actually going to do, oh, we'll see how we go for time. I'm sort of being a bit rude. Um, when you get something like this in the integrand, where you've got the square root of an entire rational function, okay? Now, I want you to think for a second. If you saw something like this, if you saw something like this in year 9 or year 10, right, even with, in the absence of a question, right, I would think most of you would instinctively say, I'm going to rationalize this denominator. And we extended that idea when we went into complex numbers and we said we can realize denominators, right? Now it turns out that the reason we do that is so that, for instance, if I had something like this, oh, I don't know. Right? Once I rationalize both those denominators, they can, they can play ball. Right? And it's, a, it's exactly the same reason with complex denominators. It's why we realize so that those two can interact with each other. But I want you to have a look up here right? and have a think about why maybe that's actually less of a useful thing. I mean, you can rationalize a denominator if you want, but in the same way as you get a first derivative, should you factorize or should you expand? Well, it depends on what you're doing next. The thing we're doing next is integrating. Have a look on the sheet. Uh, is there any problem with having an irrational denominator? No, we can actually deal with them quite comfortably, right? Is there a problem with having an irrational numerator? And the answer is, yes there is, because if it's irrational, like this, right? You can't use, say for example, your partial fractions. You can't break things apart because everything's underneath the square root. You're like, oh, gross, right? So this is me trying to explain to you why, here's your thought, right? In cases like this, almost always, rather than rationalizing the denominator, which has been our instinct for years now, when you're integrating, rationalizing the numerator, that's a messy looking M, rationalizing the numerator is almost always a much more useful thing to do. For example, if I took this, uh, this function over here, had some arbitrary u and v, and I went to rationalize the numerator, what would I multiply the top and bottom by? Think carefully. I'm just trying to rationalize, and it's just the square root of u of x on the top. So to rationalize, I guess I would multiply by the conjugate in a way, right? I'm just going to multiply by the square root of that function on the top, u of x. Now what that will give me is, I'm going to be integrating square root of u times the square root of u will just give me u. Is that okay? Now on the denominator, you may get something that looks messy, right? Because the square root of u times the square root of v is the square root of u times v. And then I'm integrating on that with respect to x. But you so often, I mean, we are interested in giving you questions you can actually solve. Um, you will so frequently get, in that denominator, a quadratic underneath the square root, then this turns into one of these other kinds of problems. Does that make sense? So therefore, rationalize the numerator, not something we're, we're used to, but um, that is probably the most useful thing to do.